Coming up on the September 15th edition of Carolina Week, one small step and a giant leap. It's time for Chapel Hill to get moving. Students at a nearby university got a nice surprise at orientation. Is it helping them make the grade? Also, would a loss by the football team this Saturday mark the end of the John Bunting era? Plus a look at your weekend forecast and what you can expect from Ivan. All that and more, Carolina Week starts now. From the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, this is Carolina Week. joining us for the Wednesday edition of Carolina Week. I'm Amanda Eiler. And I'm Lydia Garlicove. Our top story tonight. Major changes are coming to Chapel Hill, making getting around town a lot easier for you. Courtney Robinson's live in the newsroom with more. Courtney? Thanks, Lydia. It might be a little rainy outside, but the town of Chapel Hill isn't let it, letting it dampen plans for a new lifestyle change to the area. Here in Chapel Hill, town leaders are taking it one step at a time to get Chapel Hill on the right path. In order to change the pace, Chapel Hill received a $200,000 active living by design grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Building roads and sidewalks and signage, those are really expensive capital investments for a community. And so um, they were looking for where there was already potential interest, already a foundation to build on. The resulting program, Go Chapel Hill, kicked off Tuesday morning with a quick walk. Start your pedometers and join the walk. One way the town hopes to get people up is the 10,000 steps a day program. 10,000 steps is a big leap for most people. I know I have a desk job and I go to meetings and I'm on the phone and I do email. Distance signs throughout the area help residents keep a log of their activity. Officials will use the grant money to make bike lanes on major roads like Airport Road. Although Chapel Hill seems already a very active town, there are still things residents can do to put a little extra spring in their step. Um, certainly little things like parking the car at the far side of the parking lot and walking into work sounds really elementary, but it actually makes a big difference. This program is one leaders say will be successful at getting people off the couch. Now program leaders plan to give out things like this pedometer to allow residents to make sure they're meeting the 10,000 mark. Businesses are also being encouraged to allow employees a little extra time to get some exercise in. Lydia? Thanks, Courtney. Sounds like Chapel Hill is off to a healthy start. Chapel Hill isn't the only place that's up for a makeover. Carborough residents gathered Monday night to discuss plans for their own downtown revitalization. About 70 residents turned out to hear about a proposal to rebuild the strip housing the Art Center and Cat's Cradle. The center could be replaced by a five-story unit with offices, apartments, and shops. Residents also broke into groups to discuss how the new space could affect traffic in the Carborough streetscape. What it's going to do actually is just expand the best of what Carborough already has, which is perhaps the most culturally vibrant uh, downtown in a small town in, the, in, in North Carolina. If approved, the structure would be one of the first built under the town's new ordinance, allowing five-story buildings. A new name, a new design, and a whole new appeal. That's the goal for the owners of the Village Apartments on East Franklin Street. This three-story brick building is currently home to many UNC students, but its owners want that to change. They want to turn the 35 small apartments into eight condominiums and put seven of them on sale. Owners also want to change the building's name to McCorkle Place after the grassy quad just across the street. They say these changes will boost business by bringing permanent residents to downtown Chapel Hill. A city planner says these applications usually take about a year to process, so students living there have a while before it affects them. Still more changes, these to Battle Park. The university's recently transferred care of the park to the North Carolina Botanical Garden. The new caretakers will focus on conservation, creating a great place for students to grab a bite between classes. Some say a landmark in the park, the Forest Theater, could also use some care. Drama professor David Adamson hopes renovations and maybe some thinning will brighten up the stage. To use the current light towers, there would be some major pruning, uh, if not removal of trees that would have to be done. 
Organizers will soon be branching out, asking the community to help in fundraising efforts. Another major campus landmark is taking the spotlight. Thanks to a gift from a private donor, lights will illuminate the Moorhead-Patterson Bell Tower every night. Chancellor James Meeser threw the switch in the ceremonial first lighting Tuesday evening. The motto of this university is Lux Libertas, light and liberty. Let there be light. Master bell ringer Travis Kephart helped mark the occasion by playing the university's alma mater on the tower bells. Election day is quickly approaching and groups on campus are working hard to promote their parties. Co-chairman of the North Carolina Kerry Edwards campaign, Ed Turlington, addressed the UNC Young Democrats Monday night. About 200 students listened and took notes as Turlington discussed taxes, Iraq, and the uniqueness of the Kerry Edwards campaign. We have a powerful message. There are dramatic differences between the candidates, and I want to be here and have been here at Carolina tonight to talk about how John Kerry and John Edwards will take America in a much different direction. Turlington says North Carolina, with 14 electoral votes, could swing the election in Kerry's favor. The college Republicans and the Committee for a Better Carolina are hoping that bringing a widely known author and conservative speaker to campus will get young voters energized. Gerard Hall filled quickly on Monday night, with people even sitting in the balcony waiting to hear Dinesh D'Souza. D'Souza is a New York Times best-selling author and was a policy analyst for the Reagan administration. He talked about the upcoming election, why other countries are critical of the U.S., and the war against terrorism. We're not fighting a war against terrorism any more than in World War II we had a war against kamikazeism. No, we were fighting the armies of Imperial Japan. He called terrorism simply the weapon of choice. DeSouza received a standing ovation. The college Republicans set up a table to register voters and hand out Bush stickers after the speech. One organization is making sure students, both on campus and around the world, are well fed. Wednesday was the first, or the campus-wise first hunger lunch of the year. Students could shell out just three bucks to help themselves to all-you-can-eat portions of rice, beans, and cornbread. Hunger lunch usually brings in about $350, and all of the money goes directly toward a nutrition project. Sophomore Vera Fabian knows that a little rice can go a long way. We figure we'll be generous and hopefully people will be generous in return. I mean, we have people every week who come by and drop a $20 bill in our change box and stuff, so we, it pays off in the end. You can stop by the pit every other Wednesday to help fight hunger. A part of the Chapel Hill community is back, but maybe not for long, at least not in its current location. Carolina Week reporter Andrea McAfee has more. The lights are on at the Interfaith Council's homeless shelter on the corner of Rosemary and Airport Road. After six months and $450,000 in repairs, the building has opened its doors again to homeless men. They're given food, health care, and a bed during their stays. Shelter's manager, Rainy Norwood, says it gives many men another chance. People were struck with bad luck. They lost their homes, apartment, lost their jobs and stuff. So we try to help them, you know, feel like they, they can get back on their feet. The men are encouraged to find work. Kerr Drugs is one of the businesses on Franklin Street that hires the homeless, but they refuse to comment on their hiring policy. In addition to helping the clients find work, IFC officials want to move into a new larger facility that will be open 24 hours a day to better serve the residents. Whether it's in a historic facility or a new building, the men that call the shelter their home are glad that it's open again. In Chapel Hill, I'm Andrea McAfee, Carolina Week. The shelter is an historic place, which means its exterior can't be changed. There's no decision yet regarding a new site for the shelter. Well, most of us don't mind getting a little exposure. And some don't mind getting a lot. Meet the Carolina girl getting lots of exposure on the cover of a national magazine. Where's the music? I don't hear any. Arts programs are being cut, making it hard for my kids and yours. Arts education is important, so it goes. Fight for it, because the less arts kids get, the 
Mord Show. Rapping, painting, or creating music. Arts education is key. How's that, Mom? Remember what I told you, Chuck. Less bebop and more hip hop. Art. Ask for more. AmericansfortheArts.org. Awaken your creativity. Do your thing at the art school at the Art Center in Carborough. Duke freshmen are enjoying a little bonus for choosing the Durham University. But are they using that bonus the way they're supposed to? Carolina Week's Joe Mott has the story. Hi, I'm Richard Broadhead. I'm the president of Duke, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this great school. You can hear this pre-recorded message on any Duke freshman's new toy, a free iPod. In a move to integrate more technology into the classroom, Duke gave the trendy tools to all incoming first-year students. Duke manager of the Office of Information Technology, Dave Menzies, wasn't allowed to appear on camera, but he explained the origins of the program. Well, about uh, two years ago, faculty started to approach the director of Duke Center for Instructional Technology with requests for CIT to try and find ways to introduce video and audio to the classroom. <laughs> You can see students all over campus with the telltale white cords, but many can't hear much else beyond the music in their ears, which begs the question, what are the students really using their iPods for? Um, so far, I've used it for mostly music. Music. Listens to music. Speaks more for music. Downloading music. Some students care less about music and said that others were going to sell their iPod for cash. Carolina Week searched eBay and called every listed pawn shop in Durham, but no iPods. The reason? It's built into the plan. Freshmen had to sign a contract saying that the device was Duke property until the spring. But after that, the choice is theirs. In the meantime, a few students, like freshman Megan O'Toole, plan to use them for their intended purpose. In one of my classes, I have to do a presentation on Russian pop music, so the teacher suggested that we like make downloadable iPod material for the class. But most, like senior Leela Foster, think Duke officials could have spent the close to $500,000 in better ways. The system's very slow, the servers break down, and especially when we're registering, I think they could have used that towards, you know, funds for te technology. The money for the project comes from a fund specifically for technological advancements at the university. But some students think simple flyers on campus show better ways to use the money. Flyers like these cover kiosks all over Duke's campus. However, on East Campus, where a majority of freshmen live, there's one flyer you won't be seeing. As freshmen, well, they just wouldn't appreciate it. Upperclassmen on campus are less than happy about not receiving an iPod. So to vent their anger, some students printed flyers showing creative ways to deprive freshmen of their gift. Sophomore Michael Ayers says he can speak for most upperclassmen on the issue. Every time an upperclassman sees a freshman with an iPod, they hate them just a little bit more. Regardless of what the older students think of the program, the freshmen are happy to have the iPods, even when most say they just listen to music. Perhaps one of the tracks pre-recorded on the iPod said it best. It's just a different kind of work. It's take what we're giving you and make it your own. Many students at Duke have certainly taken their iPods and done with them what they want. In Durham, I'm Joe Mott, Carolina Week. Duke Information Technology Manager Dave Menzies says he won't be surprised if the program is discontinued next year. UNC freshmen purchased their computers, and they're carrying around some of the IBM's newest laptop models. Compared to the options four years ago, the newer computers have a lot more to offer. Current seniors had to purchase external wireless cards, but now everything is built into the laptop, including sa standard CD and DVD rewrite capabilities. Officials say the new IBM computers are top-notch. Students with the older computers can double their memory and speed up their processors for about $60. You might not have noticed her walking through the quad or sitting next to you in class, but people worldwide are taking notice of her on the cover of Playboy. Carolina Week reporter Rhonda Evans has this now famous Carolina Girls story. The newsstand on Elliott Road had a few more customers than usual Tuesday. The extra patrons were there to see UNC junior Evelyn Gary, who appears on the cover of the newest Playboy. Gary is the only model from UNC Chapel Hill featured in the Girls of the ACC edition. 
Being on the cover is a big deal. I was excited. It was a, a big honor to be put on the cover of Playboy. A big honor that Playboy publicist Teresa Hennessy says Gary deserves. You no, know, I think she's very energetic. Um, I think she's got that fresh-faced girl next door look. Um, she's smart as well as beautiful. Even though people lined up to get a signature for themselves and friends from the model, Gary says she hasn't gotten much attention on campus, though she wouldn't mind people asking her questions about her experience. I would encourage people to come up and talk to me about it because I think that's fine. I mean, I did it, and so I'm willing to talk about it. Chances are lots of Carolina guys will take her up on that offer. In Chapel Hill, I'm Rhonda Evans, Carolina Week. If you missed Gary on Tuesday, you can catch her October 1st at Spice Street in University Mall. Well, weather, weathercaster Rob Ellis joins us now. Rob, we've seen hurricane after hurricane. What's going on in the tropics right it now? It has been a busy season, but we are expecting this system to move into our area and provide us with some rainfall. We'll get more to that in the four-day forecast. Let's go ahead to our weather question of the day, and it is actually about hurricanes. And it is, what is the name of the strongest hurricane on record in the Atlantic Basin? Is it Hugo, Andrew, Gilbert, or Ivan? The answer in your four-day forecast when we continue. Moorhead Planetarium, where dreams become reality. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. We have ignition. We have liftoff. Join the next mission aboard the Moorhead Planetarium. For more information on Sky Rambles, call 549-6863. And welcome back to Carolina Week. I'm meteorologist Rob Ellis. Let's jump right to our weather headlines. It's going to be continued cloudy through the weekend as we move in and Hurricane Ivan makes its way into our area, providing us with some increased moisture, which is gonna give us a chance for some thunderstorms, uh, perhaps for our game day. We'll get more to that in just a moment. Let's go ahead and look at our satellite map. And you don't have to be a meteorologist to find out where our hurricane is on this map. You can clearly see the hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico approaching the Gulf Coast states. There you can see the eye and even the uh, upper level clouds are beginning to move their way into the Carolinas. Here you can see an upper level low pressure system that moved in earlier this week and gave us some moisture. But I want to make note of this area of cloudiness in the northern part of the United States. If we can go to our surface map, you'll see that this is a low pressure system that has a front draped to the south. And normally in this situation, we'll expect a hurricane to move into our area and perhaps get swept out by the front, but we don't think that's gonna happen. So let's go ahead and look at the particulars of Hurricane Ivan right now. You can see that it is a category four hurricane. It has come down in intensity just slightly. It is still moving to the north at 14 miles per hour. We expect that to continue and move into the Gulf Coast states and eventually it will move into the Appalachians and unfortunately stall out. So we will see some rainfall. So let's go ahead and take a look at our Carolina four day forecast. It looks like that moisture from Hurricane Ivan is going to be moving into the area. For the entire weekend, we will have a chance for some thunderstorms. And the lows were going to be in the 60s throughout this period and highs into the low 80s and upper 70s. Monday, we perhaps can get rid of some of that moisture from Ivan, but we will still see the cloudiness. Maybe you're headed out to the beach and you're going to try to escape some of that rainfall from Ivan. Well, unfortunately, you will have less of a chance, but the moisture is still going to be in place. Temperatures are going to be in the 80s and, on seven, and 79 on Sunday. Lows on about 71 to 70 on Sunday. If you're heading out to the mountains, it's probably not going to be the best week to head to the mountains with some of that moisture continuing to uh, pound the mountains. We're going to have continued rainfall. It perhaps could be a catastrophic flooding event if this hurricane maintains its track in the mountains. 73 on Saturday, 71 on Sunday, lows during this period in the low 60s. And for our game day forecast, it's going to be 76 for your temperature at kickoff at 605. It will be gusty with the moisture and remnants of Hurricane Ivan in our area, and perhaps you should bring an umbrella. 
will be something that you'll need. Let's go ahead back to our Carolina uh, week question of the day, and it is about hurricanes, and it is about uh, the strongest hurricane on record in the Atlantic Basin. Uh, I'm going to toss this one to Lydia. Um, having lived, living in the southeast, I think I'm going to need to go with uh, C. Gilbert. I think it, is, it is Hurricane Gilbert in 1988. It had the lowest central pressure on record of 888 millibars. Great. Thanks, Rob. Sportscaster Ann Sexton joins us now. And what's going on? Well, coming up on Carolina Week Sports, after beating Florida State in 2001, head football coach John Bunting was the toast of the Tar Heel Nation. Now just four years later, why another game played the week after September 11th might decide his future. Can I take your order, please? Uh, yeah. Hi, could I get a number two? The lemonade, please. Could you make that a number five and make it a chocolate shake? Number five with a chocolate shake. Uh, what are you doing? I'm ordering for you. Uh, uh, no, no, actually, no, no, actually, I'd like, I'd, I'd it's like a, a number, number two five with a chocolate with, shake. With a lemonade, shake. actually. Sir, sir could sorry, you, sorry, could, could you please could you stop please, that? Uh, I, I just wanted to order a number five with a chocolate I'd, shake. I'd really like you All right, to stop lady. That. I'd like you to stop it. No. I am a Tar Heel born. I'm a Tar Heel bred. And when I die, I'm a Tar Heel dead. No one knows the real Carolina like a student. Carolina Week, the student news show. Welcome back to Carolina Week Sports. I'm Ann Sexton. It wasn't supposed to happen like this. The men's soccer team is coming off back-to-back -back losses to unranked foes after being ranked seventh in the country during the preseason. Head coach Elmar Bolovich says the learning curve is steep and his team must step up to the challenge. You have to learn to win. And right now that's not the case. We still learn to play, but you know, to play and to win is two different things. Uh, we cannot let our heads go down, you know, we, we cannot go into a slum from here on. We just have to pick ourselves up. We have to stay positive. So, yeah, you can feel miserable about the losses, and we all do. But in the end, you know, we also can take something positive out of it and say we played some of the top teams in the country here early in the season with a very young squad. Let's learn, you know, let's learn and do it better in the future. And when you say you learn more by your mistakes than by the things you do well, then by the middle of the season, we should be a hell of a team. The Heels will have an opportunity to snap that losing streak earlier than expected. Their match against UNC Wilmington was moved to Wednesday from Friday night because of potentially heavy rains this weekend. Game time is set for 7 p.m. At, at Fetzer Field. Four years ago, Tar Heel football under rookie head coach John Bunting did the impossible. It knocked off the mighty Seminoles, or more accurately, knocked them out 41-9. Nearing the anniversary of that monumental game, reporter Wes Wilson says Saturday's game against Georgia Tech might prove to be just as important for Tar Heel football and bunting. On September 22, 2001, 11 days after the attacks on the World Trade Center in Pentagon, the 0-3 Tar Heel football team took the field against 6th ranked Florida State and for at least a few hours made every fan in blue and white forget about what had happened to the red, white, and blue. It was a pivotal game for head coach John Bunning and the first home game of his career. The 2001 Heels used that momentum to catapult themselves to a peach bowl berth. They won that game too. To those who were there when fans stormed the field and laid claim to a goal post, it's hard to believe how far Tar Heel football has fallen including last season's loss to rival Duke for the first time in 13 years. Senior Kenny Olson rode that goalpost to the turf his freshman year and says his opinion of the job Coach Bunning is doing now has changed since then. You know, just one year of success doesn't necessarily mean you're the right coach to lead our program. You have to be able to recruit and build a good team. He's had some tough breaks. I think it may still be too early to see him go, but it's a possibility. So far this season, the Heels have done exactly as expected. 
They knocked off Division I AA William & Mary, and let's face it, they were slaughtered by ranked Virginia. Now the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets come to Tar Heel Town, and the stakes are high for Bunning once again. There are whisperings in the media and among alumni that if the team falters again this season, Bunning could be out as head coach. Tar Heel broadcaster Jones Angel says the fact that the Heels can win this game isn't the only reason why they must. The schedule after this game is extremely difficult with games against NC State and Florida State and Miami and Virginia Tech coming up. Going to be tough for Carolina to pull a lot of wins out of those groups. Win or lose, the goalposts here at Keenan Stadium are likely safe. But John Bunning might need a win this weekend as badly as we did four years ago. In Chapel Hill, I'm Wes Wilson, Carolina Week Sports. Thanks, Wes. Kickoff is set for 6.05 p.m. It won't be televised, so if you want to watch the Heels and Jackets, you'll have to be among those at Keenan Stadium. And from bunting, we easily transition to girls with big clubs hitting tiny balls a long, long way. The women's golf team has finished up its first tournament of the season on Tuesday. The he Lady Heels climbed up the rankings on the last day to finish in sixth place. They were led by true freshman Ann Laney, who finished 14th. Well, this weekend we have... Oh, if practice makes perfect, that should bode well for the Lady Tar Heels. They don't play again until the 1st of October. What I was about to say was, we actually have every single Carolina team is playing in Chapel Hill or in Durham this weekend. So look forward to getting out and seeing those. Definitely. Thanks, Ann. Well, you see it on ESPN, Fox Sports, and even the Travel Channel. If you're one of the millions obsessed with tournament poker, put your poker face on and find out how you can win big bucks right here in Chapel Hill. Following the tragic events of September 11th, there have been hundreds of violent attacks against innocent Americans. Remember what that flag you're waving stands for. Remember, please stop the hate. We're stronger when we are united. Remember. Remember what that flag you're waving stands for. One nation. Under God. Indivisible. With liberty. And justice. For all. In America, there's either room for everyone, or it's not America. Don't pick the wrong fight. Let's keep America land of the free. Stop the hate. If you have a story idea, contact Carolina Week at 843-8292. You can also visit us online at carolinaweek.org. If you have questions about this program, write Carolina Week at Campus Box 3365, UNCCH, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 27599. Well, now's your chance to throw in all your chips and become the next Chris Moneymaker. That's right. Spanky's is hosting a weekly tournament for all you diehard Texas Hold'em fans. Crowds of folks are signing up and joining this national craze each Wednesday night. You can buy as many drinks as you like, but you don't have to fork out any cash to get your hands on $5,000 worth of chips. However, you might want to bring your best poker face or simply cover up with a hat, sunglasses, or even a ski mask. The grand prize winner gets $1,000, reason enough for student Josh Barnes to get the jitters. You don't think you can get a rush out of somebody sitting down on a table playing cards, but, you know, I mean, you, you go all in and, you know, that's all your money, you know, and somebody's going to call you. You know, it's a big deal, man. Your heart gets going. Carolina Week sports reporters Wes Wilson and John Leggett will see if they have aces up their sleeves and bring you the inside story about tournament poker next week. Well, they shouldn't have to worry about the rain inside. That's a really good thing. Just a little note for you all out there. If you bring an umbrella to Keenan Stadium this weekend, you can't take it inside. It's kind of a bummer. I don't really want to get rained on. No, and I know people wouldn't want to be losing those umbrellas. So This is true. <laughs> that does it for this edition of Carolina Week. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night. <laughs>